It's my pleasure to introduce, well, you've got a great lineup this morning. You had Dan Fisher first. We're going to wrap up the morning with Bob McEwen, our last speaker, uh, prior to a short video before lunch. But next, we have a man that is one of the, one of my favorite preachers to actually sit and listen to. He is uh, bold and he is biblical and he is a dear friend. So please give a warm welcome to our next guest speaker, the great Reverend E.W. Jackson. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. And I, 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 I will accept everything you said except the great part. Uh, I don't know so much about that, but I'm certainly grateful to have this opportunity, grateful for the invitation, I'm grateful that all you preachers and ministers of the, ministers of the gospel are here, uh, and obviously to some extent, we're always preaching to the choir when we have these events because the people who are concerned enough to come out are probably the people who we least need to reach. But if we can motivate you and inspire you and encourage you and you can go back and talk to others and change their lives, change their perspective, uh, then this is more than worthwhile. Had a couple people come up to me in the back. Uh, one young man, uh, Sean, just told me about his son, Seth. He said his son is 16 years old and I'm a talk show host on AFR. He said his son listens to me on the radio. He said, you know... My son has now started listening to EAFR because of you. And I thought, man, when you tell me a 16-year-old is listening, brother, I feel like leaping. Because that's what we're fighting for. We're, we're fighting for the next generation. We're fighting to make sure we pass on to them a country that is as good as or better than the one that has been bequeathed to us. So I want to encourage you all, keep taking a stand, keep fighting for what you know is right. Now, I'm the president and founder of STAN, staying true to America's national destiny. We have a table in the back. Our website is standamerica.us, standamerica.us. I encourage you to check us out. Uh, I'm going to stick around a little while after I'm finished, but I then have to go do my radio program. I've got to, to get that in. And I'll be talking a little bit about what's going on here. Um, and you'll get contact information in the back if you want to follow up with me. And there's a sign-up sheet if you want to get the materials that we send out. We've got a number of projects that are going on right now. And I won't take up your valuable time to get into all of that because I have an assignment and I want to do that. <clears throat> I want to thank my friend, Dr. Rick Scarborough, too, for reaching out to me. He and I have been on the front lines for a long time in this battle uh, and this, this man is a warrior for God, and I've watched him through thick and thin continue to stand up for the things of God. I saw my good friend Art Alley, who was one of the moving forces behind this. And Art, again, is these, these are great patriots who love God and love this country and are doing wonderful things. So I want to thank you all for all that you do to encourage and inspire me and all of us. All right, praise God. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit <clears throat> according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. I want to talk to you all just from this simple subject. Beware. Beware. Now, this text is very, very interesting. That word beware, the Greek word blepo, means look clearly so that you can guard against that word cheat, silagogeo, carry, lest you allow something to carry you away captive by leading you away from the truth. Traditions, paradosis, ideas and precepts 
which people have given themselves over to. And basic principles, the fundamental ideas upon which whole philosophies are built. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Well, the issue this raises for me is, is there a fundamental idea that is gripping the country right now? Is there something that is just basic, that is gripping the country right now? It says, beware the basic principles of the world. And yes, there is. And the basic principle is this. You don't have a right to what you got if someone else is strong enough to take it from you. You don't have a right to what you've got unless, unless, unless there is no one strong enough to take it from you. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Bishop, what, that's a basic principle of the world? Folks, it's the way the world's been governed. The history of mankind is replete with circumstances in which the strong take from the weak. And people see what others have, want it, and simply take it from them. I mean, is it that what happened between Cain and Abel? I mean, Cain decided that Abel had something that he wanted, and instead of trying to figure out how to improve himself, he killed his brother in order to take what he thought his brother had. And isn't that the history of governments throughout human history? That governments have not been set up to serve people. Governments have been set up to assure that the strong, the elites, the powerful, can take what they want from those who they want to take it from. Frankly, that was the byword of governance of people around the world until until the United States of America. Our country is the first country in the history of mankind that was established with the idea that governments are instituted among men to serve the people, not to rule and lord over them. Now, if you think about the fact that, that God intended human beings to be free, then you understand that throughout human history, human beings have been wrong about the nature of government. God told the children of Israel, you don't need a king. You don't need a king. You don't need a king. No, we want a king. A king will make you slaves to his own administration. No, 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 Lord, we want a king. God in, didn't intend for people to be governed by dictatorial and totalitarian power, he intended people to be free. So when you think about it, really the first governance, except for God's governance over the children of Israel himself, the first governance that was consistent with the will of God, and I don't mean we got everything right or got everything perfect, but conceptually, foundationally, the first governance that was consistent with the will of God was the United States of America. That's the, it's the first one. Because our government is supposed to protect the weak from having the strong take from them what they have. Our government is supposed to protect the freedom of the individual from those who are stronger from enslaving and imprisoning them and taking them captive. That's the nature of American government. And it's the first government established on principles consistent with the word of God. Well, my friends, then I, 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 I bring before you then this proposition. Man, I'm all tangled up here. If that's true, every one of us in this auditorium knows that the devil always seeks to destroy that which God creates. That's what he does. 
And I propose to you that America is a unique target of Satan precisely because we are a providential nation. That we are, you are a unique target of Satan because of the principles upon which we were founded. Now, I think everybody knows we have problems in this country, but I think what all of us as Christians need to understand, you know, that, and that's talking about glib ideas about we, will, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. I think we need to make sure you leave this meeting understanding that you are living in a country that is under vicious attack by the enemy because he hates God and associates this nation with God and is therefore committed to destroying it. Now, now there's not a one of you sitting here who doesn't know that Satan would love to destroy your church. If you're a pastor or you're, you're a part of a ministry, there's not a one of you sitting here who doesn't know that Satan would love to destroy what you're building in the name of Jesus Christ. And there, I would hope there's not a one of you sitting here would say, I'll just roll over and let him do it. God will take care of it. No, you're going to fight for what you know God has given you to do. There's not a single one of you here who doesn't understand that if you are a Christian and you're raising your children and you're trying to build a family around Christian principle, that Satan doesn't particularly want to target your family and destroy it. And yet, I would hope there's nobody in here who would roll over and let him do it. Well, then why in the world, if we, do, if we understand the nature of America, why would we roll over and allow the enemy to come and destroy that which God has given us? And the first point I want to leave you with is this. I hope you share this with me. If I have to be the last person standing up for this nation, if I have to be the last person standing up for that flag, if I have to be the last person standing up for, that, for, the, for, for, for the, our Constitution, I will do it until I breathe my last breath, but I will never roll over for Satan. I will never give in. I will never give up. I will never quit until the Lord calls me home. And I hope you have the same attitude. And I can add this, and we're going to win because greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. Now, my brothers and sisters, we have a major problem in our country right now. I was watching a sport, sportscaster being interviewed on Fox and Friends. And he was asked by the interviewer, this guy happened to be an American of African ancestry. He, he, um, he also expressed that he's a Christian. And the interviewer said to him, if you, knowing that you are a man of faith, how is it that you can support or agree with Black Lives Matter? And so the interviewee says, well, uh, you know, he said, given what we know about Black Lives Matter, given what we know about some of the underlying principles behind the organization, and this Christian man says, this black Christian man says, well, I don't agree with the principles of the organization. I just agree with the sentiment. And I thought to myself, that's sophistry because you cannot separate the two. You simply cannot separate the two. If you agree with the sentiment what you are buying into is this notion of separation somehow that there's some special problem uh, of police brutality against the black community that doesn't exist in any other form under any other circumstance and therefore we have to have this special idea that black lives matter. But the Bible I read tells me all lives matter and therefore... Anytime there is the loss of innocent life, we ought to care about that, regardless of the skin color of the person. Amen. Now, the first reason why that sophistry is that, and I'm going to tell you something that you probably already know, but for those of you who don't, there is simply 
statistically no epidemic of police brutality against black people. It just doesn't exist. You say, well, but Bishop, I've seen the videos. I've seen the, I've seen the recordings. You've seen what the media wants you to see. And every circumstance in which there's an inter in interaction with a black person that goes bad is promoted as if this, there is an epidemic of this is happening every day. It's happening all the time. And, and, and we've got to do something about it in the meantime. In the meantime. Oh, and by the way, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, about 2.6 million black people are arrested every year. Somewhere around 6.7 white people are arrested every year. Of the 2.6 million black people arrested every year, about 250 of those arrests end up in violent confrontations in which the suspect, in which the suspect loses his life. That is one thousandth of one percent of the interactions police have with black people in America. And I'm just talking about arrests. I'm not talking about traffic stops. I'm not talking about, you know, all situations. I'm just talking about arrests. One thousandth of one percent of those interactions end up going bad. And most of the time they end up going bad because suspects start shooting at police or start attacking police and start trying to hurt police. We just had an officer killed. Uh, uh, this officer, uh, Bohannon, in St. Louis, just killed. Well, the, 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 the perpetrator... Uh, is, is in jail right now, un, unharmed, but he killed that officer and shot another officer in the leg. They fired back. They, this didn't kill the assailant. He ultimately uh, gave up after about a 12-hour standoff. My point simply is when people start shooting at police and attacking police and trying to hurt police, it is not going to end well for them. It has nothing to do with the race of the person. They also don't tell you that about 500 Americans of, of a European ancestry are killed every year in interactions with police out of that 6.7 million arrests that the police affect, except the media doesn't care about that because there's a narrative that they want to promote that the police are out to kill black people. So every time there is an interaction in which a black person is shot or killed or harmed, then that's the, that's the nature of the country. America's hopelessly racist, hopelessly white supremacist, and all white people are beneficiaries of white privilege, and all black people are victims. I'm here to tell you I've never been a victim in my life, and I don't intend to start now. I will never be one, and we've got to stop teaching our people to be victims and start teaching them to be victors. Now, my brothers and sisters... Black Lives Matter is not about saving black lives because it breaks my heart. I could almost come to tears every time I think about it. The number of young black children, and I'm talking about 11 years old and under, who are dying in the streets of our cities. Talaferro, four-year-old kid sleeping in his bed, shot to death. Uh, a young lady named Sequoia, killed in her mother's car, when she was, her mother was trying to navigate around a Black Lives Matter uh, blockade in the street. And on and on and on it goes. Since, since George Floyd's death, 131 young children, 17 and under, have been killed. It's probably more than that because that statistic is about a month and a half old. Have been killed in the streets of our cities. And I've said you've got to step over a lot of dead bodies of innocent people to get to the one that you can use politically. It is not about saving black lives. It is about destroying the United States of America from within. That's what this is really about. Look, Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization. One of the founders, um, Patrice Cullors, said, we are trained Marxists. We are trained Marxists. Now, Black Lives Matter, this, this is, by the way, a cleaned up version of their website. Uh, in the Chicago Black Lives Matter put out a statement recently, just this past week. Quote, 
When protesters attack high-end retail stores that are owned by wealthy, the, by the wealthy and service the wealthy, that is not our city and has never been meant for us. In other words, it's okay to destroy those retail establishments because after all, that is not our city. And then they went on to talk about small business people and said, well, th that's a little bit more complicated, but they too are representatives of the capitalist exploitive system. This is not about saving black lives. This is about replacing American constitutional freedom and our constitutional republic with a socialist, Marxist, yes, communist construct. Here's what the Black Lives Matter website says. And this is a cleaned up version. They took down the original because it was so far out. They must have gotten some bad feedback and said, well, let's not tell people what we really stand for. Quote, we are guided by the fact that all black lives matter, regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity, gender identity, gender expression, immigration status. We make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. We dismantle the cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women. They used to have a thing, thing, they have a thing for trans, don't they? Impacted by trans antagonistic violence. We build a space free from environments in which men are centered. So there's a little man hatred going on here. It says, we dismantle the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts so they can mother in private even as they participate in public justice work. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family. We foster a queer affirming network, freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. Now what in the world does any of that have to do with saving black lives? That has to do with promoting homosexuality and transgenderism. And by the way, let's be clear about something. All of this sexual deviancy that has taken root in our country, some of you know, uh, uh, Dr. Rick Scarborough got involved in this when his daughter came home and reported to him the, the, the horrendous sex education material that was being given out to children. And he said, I didn't believe it. So I snuck in and sat in the back to listen myself. He said, and my mouth dropped open. I could not believe what I was hearing. The things that they were promoting to these children. Well, do you know that the first sex education program was started by a Hungarian communist named George Lukacs? And he started it with the explicit purpose of undermining Christianity and destroying relationships between children and their parents by teaching the children that their parents were idiots for believing in things like monogamy and sexual purity and, 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 se and, and no sex before marriage and, and all of that. He knew that if we can get the children to buy into sex simply for pleasure, to be able to do whatever you want to do and tell them that their parents' old-time so-called Christian ways are passe, we can drive a wedge between children and their parents. And in doing so, we can destroy the family. I'm sure most of you didn't think about the fact, didn't, didn't know that, that sex education began as a communist strategy to separate children from their families. This stuff comes right out of the Marxist playbook, folks. And, and, and Black Lives Matter, if, if, if there's any single thing that can help transform the black community it is for men to come back to their rightful place as fathers and husbands and take care of the children that they father. And you got Black Lives Matter saying, we don't want that. I mean, folks, what, 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 now, now how do we get here? How do we get here? This all starts with a man named Antonio Gramsci. Now, Antonio Gramsci is a devotee of Karl Marx. But he was a communist theorist uh, in Italy, the head of the Communist Party in Italy, who took a different view than Karl Marx. Because Karl Marx believed that the way you change a society is through violent revolution. But Antonio Gramsci, looking at a place like the United States of America, said, well, look, when you have a country like that, 
that is not held together by force, but is held together by a common set of values, the way you undermine that country is that you have to do what he called, you have to replace their cultural hegemony with a new set of values. You have to undermine the nation culturally from within. So, for example, you undermine the principle of freedom by replacing it with the principle of equality. So, well, what's wrong with equality? Well, equality from the communist perspective is not just equality of opportunity. We've got to make everybody equal because that's the only thing that's fair. And the fact of the matter is you can't do that. It's not possible. Folks, one book I read about socialism said that the, one of the most kind and decent Socialist that's ever came come on the scene was the head of uh, Tanzania, Julius Nereri. He was world-renowned for his decency and his kindness and, and, and the way he treated people. And when he finally developed his theory of how to make Tanzania a prosperous country, it was to move everybody into villages. Except he found out that the people who lived in homes and apartments and other places didn't want to move into villages. So this kind, decent socialist burned down their apartments, burned down their houses, and sent them into the villages at the point of a gun. It always ends that way. You know, equality. We're going to make everybody equal. But it always ends at the point of a gun. You must undermine faith in God. See, now, now Karl Marx said the church and religion are the opiate of the masses. You've got to get rid of the church. Now, nah. Gramsci said, no, no, no. You don't need to get rid of it. You have to repurpose it. So instead of it being about personal salvation and a relationship with God, it's about social justice. And so now you've got churches adopting critical race theory as part of the way they address racial issues. Critical race theory comes straight out of the Marxist playbook. Because they, the, the fundamental idea of critical race theory is that it, basically what we're seeing in this country promoted by the left. All people are racist. All white people. Let's be clear. Because race is about power. And systemic racism, you can't measure it, you can't identify it, you can't prove it, you can't find evidence of it, it's just there. So therefore you can spend eternity trying to get rid of it, you never can. So the only way to get rid of it, you have to transform the society completely. You undermine the family, as I've said, by separating the children from the values of their parents. we got a whole set of millennials right now who believe completely contrary often to what their parents have taught them. And I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to parents who have said, I, I raised my child with Christian values. I homeschooled my child. I sent them off to college, and after the first year, they came back a different person. You separate the children from the values of their parents. And here's the last thing. You do away with the idea of absolute truth. Because you see, from a Marxist point of view, the only truth that matters is the truth that advances the interests of the party. So truth is out the window. So this idea that we hold these truths to be self-evident, no, 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 we don't. We don't. That all men are created equal. No, no, they're not. The government has to make us equal. And that they are endowed that by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. I've heard leftists say, we know that God didn't give anybody rights. Rights come from power. There's no fundamental right in the Bible for two people of the same gender or in the Constitution for two people of the same gender to marry. That doesn't exist. You know, I've made this distinction. You all forgive me for being a lawyer. But I've made this distinction between Supreme Court made-up rights and constitutional fundamental rights. You know, there are rights the Supreme Court just makes up because it's imbued with the politics of the time. So it made up a right to abortion, and it made up a right to gay marriage, and it will make up other rights. But the fundamental rights given to us by God are not to be found in those Supreme Court decisions. They are not they are not according to the Constitution, and they are not according to the will of God. So here's, the, here's the, 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 the last thing I want to share with you in understanding this. 
What we are witnessing in our country right now with the racial conflict is not about racial justice. Antonio Gramsci's thinking helped communists and Marxists and socialists in America to understand something. You can't have class warfare in America. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because, like me, the son of a, of a, of, of a man with a, a sixth grade education and a third class welder in, in, a, in, a, in a shipyard, graduates from Harvard Law School and, and lives an affluent wife, uh, life, my wife and I, three degrees between us, and we've raised wonderful children, and they're all gainfully employed, and, and they're all living good lives. It's hard to have class warfare when people can be born with nothing and become affluent and wealthy and influential and, and succeed by dint of their gifts and their talents and their hard work. It's very, very hard to do that. See, that wasn't true in Europe, but it's true in America. So you've got to figure out something else that can allow you to create the conflict that can bring the nation to a point of critical crisis. And race is that thing. See, because unlike class warfare, you can't... You, look, Americans, for the most part, aren't envious of wealthy people. Americans are trying to figure out, how can I get wealthy? But if you can make race the issue, Think about this. Think about this. You can remove it. You can remove the analysis from all rationality and all logic and all actual circumstances so you have a billionaire like Oprah Winfrey telling some poor white kid that he is her oppressor. See, that won't work with class, but it'll work with race. You can have LeBron James, who was a near billionaire himself, complaining about the fact that, you know, he, he's, he's like the equivalent of Emmett Till. What? I mean, here you are, rich and famous and influential, and, and you're, you're the equivalent of Emmett Till because somebody wrote some graffiti on your mansion? You can even have Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre. Former convicted felon, drug dealer, gangster rapper. He is a billionaire now. And you can have him standing up talking about how unfair America is. <laughs> These people are wealthy beyond most Americans' imagination, and yet they're, they're victims. See, because... What, what, what these Gramsciites have done is to trade class warfare with racial conflict. And that you can continue to perpetuate even among people who have experienced the very best that the United States of America has to offer. And so you need to understand what we are up against. We are up against a pernicious ideology. And so what should I do, Bishop? What, what should we do? Number one, expose it. Expose this stuff. Uh, I don't know whether you're going to be hearing from uh, Trevor Loudon. Trevor and I are working very closely on a project called Stand Against Communism. And we called it that because we want Americans to understand that, according to Lenin and Stalin, socialism was simply the road to communism. And that you can't really distinguish the two. Don't let them soft sell this stuff and convince people on our young people, oh, this is just about fairness. No, it's about totalitarian government and control over people. I mean, what kind of country are we going to pass on to our children? Isn't that the issue? Are we going to pass on to them a totalitarian country? Ronald Reagan said freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. We do not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for and protected and passed on to them to do the same, or we will spend our sunset years telling our children about the United States of America where we were once free. And you can see the signs of it now. We used to believe, I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend with my life your right to say it. That's what we used to believe. And now we say, no, you can't say it because I consider it hate speech and offensive. And you've got to shut up and you've got to be shut down. See, we used to believe that hard work is how we earn our living. My daddy was a proud black American. And you know, they would come around through the neighborhoods and pass out free cheese and and my father would tell them, I work for a living. I don't take handouts. 
That's the way most Americans used to think. And now the whole culture is imbued with this entitlement mindset. Everybody owes me and give it to me. I don't know whether you all saw the clips of, of the, 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 the BLM protesters that went out into the suburbs of Seattle, shine lights into people's houses and stood outside and said vile things I'll never repeat, but said in effect to them, give us your houses. We deserve it and you don't. You stole it from others. We want it back. We used to be a country where we'd be insulted at the idea of somebody giving us something that we didn't earn. That's the way my father was. That's, I met a guy from Southwest Virginia. I grew up in the urban environment of Chester, Pennsylvania. He grew up in Southwest Virginia. We got to talking about our dads, and we said, you know, I think our fathers knew each other, didn't they? Because that was the American way. That was, that was American culture. That was the way we thought. And they're trying to take that away from us. And look, they're making headway. Unless we expose what is really going on. We're looking at the Gramsciite revolutionizing of America. We're looking at the undermining of our culture. And we've got to be absolutely uncompromising in it. That's why I say, I don't go along with Black Lives Matter. You can, you can package it any way you want. In fact, we're starting a movement called the All Lives Matter Movement to bring Americans together to solve our problems instead of allowing these people to divide us and set us against one another. <laughs> Expose it for what it really is and then oppose it. Oppose it. Don't let anybody cow you. Don't let anybody back you down. Uh, I was talking to my assistant on the way here, and he told me, he said, I tried to explain some people to people, some of my black friends, some of the things that we know, and they didn't even want to hear it. They didn't even want to hear it. I mean, it was as if there was a wall there, and you just couldn't penetrate it. But you know what? Keep opposing these lies anyway. Keep opposing them anyway. Because I can't begin to count the number of times, and I'm not saying this because of me. I think it's because any of us, if we do it enough, somebody will come up to you and say, you know what, I thought about what you said. And you know, you're right. I can't tell you, one, one of my dearest friends, he and his wife, confirmed Democrats, came to a meeting that I was speaking at, and he called me later on the phone and wanted to have lunch with me. And you know what he told me? True story. He said, my wife and I wept the whole way home. He said, because we realized we had been lied to. We had been duped. We had been voting a certain way because we were told that's the way black people voted. And we hadn't considered what God wanted from us. And I can't tell you the number of times similar things have happened to me. If you stand up for the truth, the truth has a power of its own. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will pa never pass away. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oppose these lies. If the truth makes you free, lies put you in bondage. And we got a lot of people in bondage right now, and we got to make sure that they're set free. So yes, look, the fight is on. The fight is on. You got to put on the whole armor of God so that you're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And having done all the stand, stand. Have your loins guard about with truth. Have on the breastplate of righteousness. Have on the shield of salvation. The, head, the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You got to be ready to fight. God didn't call us to lay down. God didn't call us to quit. God called us to stand up. He said, put on the whole armor of God and stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I've been told by some political friends not to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I have to have security in my church because about two months ago, I got a very serious death threat. Somebody called the office, and they said something like this. This is close to a quote. I would hate to have to go to jail for shooting and killing E.W. Jackson, but it looks like that's the way it's going to have to be 
boom, boom, and then added an expert at the end. Click. The FBI looked at the, 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 the threat and said that it was real, and they're investigating it. Uh, and, and you would ask me, well, Bishop, how has it changed what you do and what you say and changed your life? Other than having security at my church because strangers walk in all the time, not one bit. Not one bit. For the Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is the strength of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? When the wicked, even our enemies, came to eat up our flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should arise against us, our hearts will not fear. So war would rise against us, in this will we be confident. One thing we have desired of the Lord, that will we seek after, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide us in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide us. He will set us up upon a rock. He will lift our heads up above our enemies. Therefore will we offer the tabernacle sacrifices of joy. We'll sing. Yes, we'll sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and help me. For when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face, Lord, will I seek. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. For don't you dare say, Lord, have you forgotten me? Where is my justice? Have you not known? Have you not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait... They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. 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 We have a wonderful country. We have a country worth fighting for. We have a country worth dying for. But don't you dare put your trust in the economy because we found out the economy can turn on a dime. Don't you dare put your trust in the military because the military can be subverted. Don't you dare put your trust in politics. We've got to be active, but remember, we're not dealing ultimately with a political battle, but with a spiritual battle. Don't even put your trust in the Constitution. George Washington said constitutions can be converted by corrupted morals and overwhelming ambition. But I'll tell you what I want to leave you with. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ. The solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Come on, can you say yeah? yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. I read the back of the book and we win.